in a world full of negative people. Hey man, I'm just trying to be a positive guy, a positive farmer, a positive outfitter. This is the Shark Farmer Podcast with your host, Rob Sharkey. Whatever. And welcome again to Shark Farmer Podcast. Hey, I'm your host, Rob Sharkey. And today we're going, well, I'm not exactly sure where we're going. He's from Rochelle, Illinois, which is just north of me. I think he lives in Silicon Valley, but he's in New Mexico. Am I even close to being right, Daniel? That's close enough. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me, Rob. It's been a pleasure. Daniel Carmichael, you're out there in New Mexico. What are you doing out there? Checking out this International Balloon Festival. I think it's one of the, the largest in the world. They, they said there's over 600 balloons registered this year here. Please tell me that there is a balloon in the shape of like that movie Lift or what Up? Where the Disney movie where the guy put all the balloons yeah. on his house? Just, I have not seen that, but any kind of balloon you imagine, it's out here. They really come up with some really creative ones. Huh. Balloon payments? <laughs> payments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably some of those, too. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> that's a good one. I'm sure there is, yeah. <laughs> You're a friend with a good friend of mine, so he's he was kind of telling me about you. I appreciate you coming on the podcast and telling a little bit about your story about your business and what you, what you did, what your family did, what you're doing now. It's really interesting. But for a lot of people that don't know, you get outside of Upper Illinois, you might not know like the whole Maplehurst. I don't know. What is the footprint of that company? We're in five counties there in, in north central Illinois. So we reach, you know, as far south as Amboy, Lee Center. Then we go up into Rockford and then we go in DeKalb County as well. And we've got locations in Kings and Davis Junction. So our footprint is about five counties there in, in North Central Illinois. Yeah, it's a big deal up here. But for the people <laughs> that don't know you, give a little bit of background of who you are. Yeah, I'm a fifth generation in the business. It's a fascinating story. And it's, it's one that great, great grandfather came on an orphan train. Him and his brother, his brother got off in Ohio and, and he whoa, got off. Whoa, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, what's an orphan train? So back in the day, they had these trains, and I you know, I can't speak to a whole lot of detail on it, but they had these trains that were comprised of, you know, orphans that would come from New York and would leave. And then uh, farmers or, you know, people who needed help would come and, I wouldn't say indentured servants, but more or less come and, and take these children off the trains and, and raise them. So that's how we got a route in Illinois there. You're kidding me. Um, I've never but, heard that. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, it worked out. Well, I mean, yeah, things obviously worked out very well. There was a lot of hard work involved. And my grandfather wrote a book, and it goes into much more detail about all of that. But what's the name of the book? Yeah, it's uh, Life and Times of L.D. Carmichael or Leonard Carmichael. Okay. Yeah, I think, I don't know if it's available on Amazon still or not, but uh, anybody that goes to the elevator, $15 donation to uh, the Rochelle Area Community Foundation will get you one of the books. So, yeah, the fascinating book, especially if anybody's interested in just the history of Illinois, it's, it's just a good book. You know, 1900s in Illinois, it, it does a good job of showcasing that. To me, that's fascinating. All right, I interrupted you, but your great-grandfather landed in Illinois, and then what? Things took off from there. We were the stock farm, had some issues in the stock market crash. The grandfather goes into detail on that, I think, in the book as well. But it really became, from a farming operation to a business, my grandfather, Leonard Carmichael, he's the one that really transformed it into a business, basically, Got tired of sitting in line at a co-op and went ahead and built his own elevator and overbuilt his own elevator and started taking on customers. And then it kind of just snowballed from there. Okay. So as you growing up, were you helping out on the farm or were you more helping out on the business side? I kind of started out as a, an entrepreneur at a very young age. I can remember using my 4-H skills, which were poster making skills at the time. I started selling uh, hot chocolate in the fall to customers coming in, you know, set up shop next to the scale. A terrible business idea because we had coffee that was free that was like, you know, five <laughs> feet away from where I was selling my hot chocolate. So bad business idea. Then the second little business I tried starting up was a car wash business. That lasted about a month. We had, uh, I can remember my dad coming up after dinner and talking with me about 
basically what I did was I created this really cool poster and gave different prices for car washes. You know, my only customers were our employees. It was great captive audience, you know, and I'm just a little kid, so hard to say no to. And some employees that had company vehicles, and then they would just turn that in on their expense report. Well, that, you know, my my dad saw the the next month later, and he said, well, I think it's time to bring you on as an employee because you're not going to be paying the rent I'm going to charge you for our wash bay. And so uh, so then <laughs> then I uh, figured out that business idea wasn't going to work either when, uh, you know, you're still living underneath the parents' roof. So Sounds like so, yeah, it was working I, uh, fine to me. I see. Your it only problem fine. was the hot cocoa. You should have added some whiskey yeah. in that. You would have totally outsold yeah, that free yeah, coffee. You're, <laughs> you're right. I should have. So <laughs> started at a young age, always a business side, sweeping bins. It's the really the tough jobs. Mowing lawn wasn't tough. I mowed a lot of lawn growing up. We got a, a lot of lawn to mow there. Sweeping bins, cleaning pits out, just the, the smelly fun jobs. Okay. Was it a deal where you were the, uh, the boss's son still had to go in? Well, you had to do a bad job with the worst smelling substance on the face of the earth, the rotten soybeans. <laughs> yes, I would agree with that. That is by far the worst smelling eye burning uh, <laughs> substance there is. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly how it started out. And then uh, when I was 12, my dad unfortunately passed away in his sleep. And um, I would say things changed there for the, the working environment. I probably rebelled a little bit. I wasn't the, the best employee. You know, my mom, I love her to death. Shout out to all the single parents out there. She was raising three boys and we're all two years apart. Hired a, uh, a general manager out of Minnesota by the name of Jim Black. He took my dad's place. We had some interim managers, but uh, mm-hmm. he was ultimately the general manager to take his place. And he basically sat me down and lack of a better word, said, Daniel, you need to go get a job somewhere else. At the time, I certainly had some choice words for the guy, but uh, looking back on that, probably one of the best things that uh, ever happened because I got to go outside the family business, which is something I recommend everybody do. I mean, farming or anything, I think that it's it's good to get that experience to how to work with other people that aren't your family Mm -hmm. necessarily. Probably one of the best things for me at the time, I I don't even think I had my license yet. My mom had to cart me back and forth. So I bus tables at, at Petro. You, you probably know where Petro is there. It's, it's uh, 39 and 88 there. Um, but uh, yeah, but I don't know if I ding for that, but it was, it was an experience. It was certainly, <laughs> certainly an experience. Learned a lot about life in general. Well, but, okay. Uh, wait yeah, a minute. That's, uh, you're 12 years old. I remember 12. 12 was not an easy age. I mean, you're you're going through yeah. changes in life. Everything's weird. And then on top of that, you have this massive blow to you. You lost your dad. So you said you were kind of rebelling. You would rebel without losing your dad when you're 12 because you're dumb at 12. This new manager, uh, was it a deal like he was thinking that you weren't good for the business or was he trying to establish himself as the the guy who didn't want the old family members around? You know, at the time, I would have said the latter. But looking back at that, I mean, he just knew that the best thing for me was to get out and and have some experience outside the business. Certainly thank him for that today. But like I said, at the time, I I, I had some choice words for the guy. But 12 was when I lost him. You know, 15, 16 is when I I started working for, uh, for somebody else. Never came back to the business talk. After college, and I had a job in Chicago. I worked for uh, AT&T as a, a lineman on the poles. I loved that job. The reason I came back, I, I took a motorcycle trip with my grandfather, and he rode motorcycles well into his 80s. So him and I went on just a weekend trip. At the time, you know, I'm a young 20-something, so I had a crotch rocket, which was perfect for Chicago <laughs> long-distance road trips with my grandpa and his uh Goldwing, not so much. Yeah, can uh, imagine. But still, it, it was it was a trip, and he would never go on the highways either. He would everything was back roads for him. So <laughs> it was a beautiful scenic trip. You know, I can remember it like it was yesterday. We were at a Perkins up in northern Wisconsin, and he basically gave me a speech about coming back to the family business. He was a really hard guy to say no to, and made some really good points. Needless to say, I came back to work, put in my two weeks' notice the next day, and uh, and that was in 2008. That's okay. when I that's when I came back to Maplehurst. Yeah. 
All right. I'm trying to I'm trying to like kind of put myself in your position, right? Because uh, for the people that don't know, Maplehurst is a well run company. It does very well. So, you know, you lost your dad at 12, 15, and the new guy says, you know, beat it. And then you end up, okay, it's a job, but it's not a very glorious job. I mean, you're, you're working at a restaurant like that. Uh, there had to be some bitterness towards the family <laughs> business. I would have bitterness towards a family business, but, well, and I know you're traveling with an 80 year old because you stop at freaking Perkins, but you go to Perkins with your <laughs> grandfather and he, he sits there and he tells you basically that you need to go back and be a part of the family business. I mean, am I anywhere close? Yeah, I wouldn't use the word need. I mean, he made good arguments. I mean, like you said, it was a very well-run business, doing very well at the job I had at the time. But still, when you think about legacy and, and all the heritage and, and all these other things that Champs to be a part of, I'd say the word that he used was need because he just made some good points about coming back. And so it was a choice I made, and I was very glad I made that choice. But uh, Did Grandpa yeah. sell you on it? I mean, be honest. He sold. He, he sold me on it. Yeah. He? <laughs> he was a great salesperson. Yeah, yeah. I think it's neat that you went back. Now, how did how did that go? I mean, is it, it was a deal like your family owns it? There's always a position there for you, or is how did you get a job back at the family business? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yes, yeah, family business. You know, there's always something available, but I wouldn't say they they made a position for me. I my background is all in, in technology and IT, and so. Mm -hmm. Um, that was definitely somewhere we were lacking. That's where I came in at. But, uh, you know, in a, in a small family business, you wear a lot of hats. And the first thing I did was get a CDL. You know, get a truck driver that calls in. Well, you know, you're you're behind the wheel hauling grain to process or the ethanol plant or the river or wherever you're going. But, yeah, multifaceted, which is something that I, I love. And to this day, I mean, it's, I, I'm pretty sure I did everything in the company. At least I tried to every every single role. So we have the big egg retail part. So Mixing chemicals, hauling loads out to the fields, spraying, like every, everything. I, I, I tried to do as much as I can, as, as fast as I can to really get the experience underneath my belt, you know, when I came back. I don't know you. I mean, this is the first time that we've talked. I trust a person that is a good friend of yours. And he he has told me that this is not like the boss's son that comes back and, you know, just sits in a desk and whatever, that you put your time in at Maplehurst. You were very valuable to it. It was actually sweat equity, and also uh, you imp did improvements to that company. So trying to get this understanding, I don't want people to to think that I'm trying to dig at where, where were you actually working, because I am told by someone that I trust that you did. Yeah, you wouldn't last long if you weren't. People, especially customers, too, they just, the respect wouldn't be there if, if, you, if you didn't do that. And I guess that's just my, my personality. It's it's my DNA. It's how I was raised. You know, if there's a job to do, do it. Or, you know, if somebody needs help, you know, everybody pitches in. I, that's uh, not and, always and, and, the case, again, though, uh, because we've all <laughs> seen uh, farms, uh, co-ops, businesses, everybody that, you know, the kid comes back, the kid doesn't appreciate it. I just sitting here wondering. You know, you are one of the ones that appreciated it and worked hard. I wonder if it goes back to that guy that told you to leave, the new manager. I mean, is is that true? I do give him some credit because, yeah, it, it probably does. It certainly does. But it goes back, I mean, raised that way. I, I unfortunately didn't, didn't know my father that well because, you know, he was always working. I mean, think of farmers and how hard they work. Well, when you're serving farmers, when, you're, when your business is, you know, customer service to, to farmers and you have to work that much harder. My mother, she grew up on a dairy farm and as you, you know, interviewed multiple people from dairy farms, it's, all it is is work, it seems like. Started at an early age, but certainly, yeah, I, I certainly give some credit to him. Oh, yeah. Working with farmers is the worst. You can be honest. I know it. <laughs> it's, hey, are you going to pick today, Rob? No, not at all. Well, an hour later, I'm calling begging for a truck. Yeah, yeah, you you got it. Yeah, and it could be a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So, so, and I think the reason why we were so successful we are so successful is that we get that once you get in these big corporate companies, they don't, they don't get that. I, I, I'd attribute that to a lot of our success is that 
the customer service aspect and really understanding that maybe when you got to go, you got to go. And, you know, it, it, okay. but yeah, it can be a pain sometimes for sure. So you're back at Maplehurst. You're back at the family business. You're working. The things are going well. What yep. happens then? So, yeah, things are going well. I've, my older brother and I, we were the really the only two working in the company. He uh, was married, three boys, um, and uh, yeah, I just really took every opportunity I could, like I said, to do all the different jobs that we had in the company. Mm -hmm. um, in 2009, grandfather passed away. It wasn't a sudden death, which we got to spend some time with him before he passed, which was good. Mm -hmm. Still doesn't make it easy. Yeah. No, it still doesn't make it easy, right? Um, but uh, now, how old was he when he so, passed away? Um, I, I couldn't say for sure. He was he was in his eighties. I want to say eighty six. I could be wrong there. Was he uh, still riding a bike up until like towards the end? Oh, it's very, very, very active up until the end. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. I can hardly ride one now. Yeah. yeah. It was great because, I mean, obviously I, I had, uh, I mean, he, our whole immediate family lived very close to each other and he lived literally the closest neighbor I had was my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, spent a lot of time with him, uh, working with him and a lot of life lessons, you know, from him, certainly. Later when I came back, I got to, got to spend some time with him as well and, you know, got to ask him all those questions that I, I didn't think of when I was a child. I remember the last dinner I had with him, it was just him and I, we went out to eat and uh, I asked him if he had any regrets. And he said his only regret was not spending enough time with his kids it resonated with me. And at the time I'm just thinking, okay, well, this is easy. I just won't have kids. Or at the time I was thinking, well, I just, you know, I'll wait till later in life and uh, I'll solve that problem, you know? And I mean, he passed in 09 and then the business continued on. We continued growing and, Every year we try and build a bin or do an upgrade project. We've got 11 different locations, so growing, growing, growing. Fast forward to, you know, this year, unfortunately, you know, I had the, the loss of my uh, my older brother. Um, and not to go into a whole lot of detail, but, I mean, it was, it was definitely tough. Um, we were... Uh, moving a bin from one location to another and, and just got uh, too close to a set of power lines. And uh, he, he was uh, too too close to the action. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but yeah, that was definitely, definitely tough. I think that uh, for, for a lot of reasons, you know, he left behind a, a wife and three kids and, you know, that kind of, goes to how I was raised, you know, I, I lost my dad and you know, my mom raised three kids, you know, there. And so, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely a tough, tough summer. I can only imagine. I, I, I didn't know you didn't know your family, but I remember hearing about that accident. That was, uh, that was very unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. How, how old was he? Uh, he would have been, uh, 36. Yeah. 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 That's way too young. Uh, yeah. Obviously that had to be a devastating blow to the whole family. You know, you talked about how like when your grandfather passed, it was kind of expected. And, you know, as far as like family and business, it all went on. This incident, I can't imagine was the same. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, um, definitely, yeah, difficult to say the least. And, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know what else to say. It, it was, it was it, yeah, yeah. tough still to this day. Yeah. yeah. All right. So after the passing of your brother, you just go back to work is, I mean, how does that go? Yeah. I mean, work still had to be done. So, I mean, back to work it's certainly what he would have wanted to so we i mean everybody uh just, just back to work and uh started uh looking at things differently i think that the one thing that i've, I've realized at a young age you know how fragile life is 
and how short it is and work hard and play hard, you know, I, I, to uh, experience life and, and get out of my comfort zone. Soon after that, I made the decision then to um, take this job out here in, in California. It was not an easy decision by any means. At the same time, I just I wanted to to get out and uh, and do something different and challenge myself in, in a different way. I, I won't say that that was the entire reason, but it definitely had a lot to do with it. I got to imagine you there, you lost your brother at your business. I guess I would probably start looking at things differently. You think the wanting to challenge yourself or maybe moving away from some of those old memories was more of the reasons that you decided to uh, go a different path in your career. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, coupled with just, I mean, coming upon this incredible opportunity to be part of something really big and be, be part of something where it doesn't matter how hard you work, you know, you still had people that would look at you and say, he only has what he has because of that family business. And, and, uh, oh, yeah. I kind of wanted to get away or out from underneath that shadow too. And it played a role in it as well, for sure. I totally understand that. I think I would probably be the same as you see people go back to family businesses and work their tail off and but there is always that attitude and it's generally stemmed by jealousy it is what it is you're yeah, a smart yeah. guy uh you're a more on the tech side so what opportunity did you find uh out in silicon valley so the startup's called bear flag robotics and, and basically it's what we're doing is we're making self-driving technology for tractors and it's not uh, specific to any, any one OEM or, or, you know, we're not just on John Deere or we kind of span across different uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that that's the, the next step and where, and where we're going in, in agriculture. There's all these te technologies out there, but this is the one that I really am passionate about. And I think that, uh, um, there's really, really something there. It's a very, very early on, uh, only eight employees right now at this point, definitely, uh, got a big foothold and, and, uh, got a lot of things figured out a huge opportunity. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to be a part of this, this company It's just a group of incredibly intelligent people that are just passionate as can be about, uh, about what we're doing and got some pretty <laughs> lofty goals and, but yeah, working hard to, to make something happen here. Self-driving tractors is not new. I mean, what are you guys doing differently no. about it? No, it, that's a good point. Uh, definitely not new, but we're trying to make it so that the perception and the, and the, the tech is there that it's going to be better than what you could be, the, the driver could be in the cab. And we don't want to take the, the driver out of the cab either. I mean, if you wanted to be in your tractor, you could still be in your tractor you could either be, you know, driving or watching it. You know, you see a lot of a lot of different uh, companies that are, you know, just trying to go completely autonomous with no cab or anything like that. But we're we're not trying to do that. We're still keeping the the farmer, the producer in the loop. It's just the, the tech is going to be there. The goal is to to make it so that uh, it's going to be better, hopefully better than uh, what you would see or do in, inside that cab. And so it it comes with a lot of teaching and a lot of learning and mm -hmm. a lot of data. And so it, it's going to start off as a service to begin with, just because we don't want to turn tractors loose in a field uh, without anybody around. And so we do. Producers hands. That's what you need to work on. <laughs> Screw this stuff. Here's the thing. You need to work at where the farmer can ride in it for the first hundred hours. And then we're done. We're basically, yeah, it's, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. That's what we love doing after a hundred hours. I'm like, ah, this is, I'm done with this crap. A hundred hours, well, it's, it's, and then you need to take yeah. complete control. And that's where it's going. And so it's it's all about the teaching aspect and getting it through all these different environments. The customers that we've had so far, it's it's, it's been it's been a real learning experience. Uh, to give you an example, you're in uh, in Hedford, uh, California. A lot of dairies in that area, and uh, dairy farmer. We were uh, just disking for uh, some of his silage ground, and Friday afternoon, Friday evening, and and he rolled up in his Ford F-150 with his two two granddaughters in the truck and he came out and he, he thanked us. He was like, you know what, you know, I would have been out here this, this evening doing all this, but you know, this tractor's out here doing it for me and I got to take my two granddaughters out to dinner and so it's like, okay, when you hear that from a customer, it's like, all right, well, I know I'm doing something right here. We're on the on the right track here. So we got a ways to go, but it's 
there's definitely something there. It's coming. I nobody can yeah. say it's not. I mean, just look at the self driving cars and that. And uh, yeah, I don't know what the tractors in the future will look like, but I'm assuming if the next generation of my farm, whatever that looks like, is going to be spending less and less time in a tractor cab. Right. You've yeah. done a lot of traveling, though. I mean, like overseas. Yeah. Now, has that helped you in uh, kind of broadening your mind of how you think about this stuff? Yeah, certainly has. You know, I spent some time over in Brazil touring different ag operations there and never really viewed South America as a threat until you go over there and you see the size and the operations that, that are going on over there. Dude, um, I don't know, want I, to hear I, that. I, Come on, man. I, I know. And no, no, nobody does. It's fascinating to me. I mean, it, it, it reminds me of what probably the 18 or 1900s were mm -hmm. here. I mean, you've got these little small farming towns that are just booming. You know, I I got my hair cut on the the street corner, you know, because the barbershop was still being built there. It's, it's a dangerous area for the, the highways. They're really rough shape. Their transportation isn't there. But the farming operations, boy, they're you know, just a, a whole, totally different scale. Yeah, it's but, scary. Uh, it is. But at the same time, you know, I, I don't speak any Portuguese. I had a translator with me. And and when I say the roads are bad, I mean, we literally ripped the back bumper off of our car just <laughs> from these big potholes. I mean, it's just, it was crazy. But I mean, we would just show up randomly on people's farms and they would just welcome us and show us around. And they're very, very proud of what they're doing over there, too. And yeah, Brazil. And, and then uh, with the Ag Leadership Group, we got to go to Europe. We got to go to Germany and Poland and, and tour a lot of different farming operations over there. And Germany's very, very, uh, the, the farms we toured there are very clean and very well kept. We do a lot of, you know, renewable energy projects and things like that. And Poland was, I'd say, probably kind of the opposite. The funny story with the Polish farmer we went and visited, he was a pig farmer and Probably not the best kept farm, but still just a very charismatic, very nice guy. Didn't didn't speak any English. I don't even know if we had a Polish translator, but we just kind of knew what he was talking about by uh, what he was pointing at, the things he was going through. And he took us into his feed mill where he was grinding up feed, and he had this big unmarked sack, and he ripped it open, and it, you know, a bunch of little black pieces fell to the floor, and the guy behind him starts shoveling it in with the with the rest of the feed, and he picks up a piece and he eats it off the floor and we we're all looking at him like what, what's this guy doing and then he picks up a handful and starts passing it out to us to eat and it turns out there's a chocolate factory in his, in his town that <laughs> they'd give him all of the, all of his chocolate rejects and he was feeding the chocolate to the pigs and they loved it so <laughs> but uh, but at the time i mean jaws were on the ground like what, what's this guy trying to feed us anyway it's been interesting traveling especially when it comes to the farming side. I mean, everybody is so welcoming. And even working at Maplehurst, we got to do tours constantly of, of international groups, mostly because of our proximity to Chicago, mm -hmm. um, because we were so close to Chicago. We'd have all these tour groups. I mean, you name it, people from uh, Mongolia and uh, Asia and just all over the world would come and we'd, we'd show them around the farm, the elevator and, and what we were doing. And Well, I tell you what, let me ask you yeah, something. I just got back from Germany. Everything out there was, uh, you have to be sustainable. Everything's about the environment, yeah. and it's, it's going to yeah. lay on the farmer's back. You're out there in Silicon Valley. What are you seeing along those lines? I mean, is that the attitude of people out there that the environment is priority number one, and the biggest part of that is uh, getting the farmers to farm right? Yes and no. A lot of people are out of touch, to be honest with you. And I've only been out here for a few short months, and so I, I can't really speak in a lot of detail. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you that people's idea of what a farm and a tractor is, it's, I would say there's a lot of disconnect, for sure. Sure. They think that uh, sustainability is easy, but in reality, I don't think it's quite how easy everybody thinks it ought to be. Okay. How long before but, uh, you'll no, have my tractor driving by itself? We can have a drive in itself tomorrow if you want. I mean, I would be a, a little leery about it, but uh, <laughs> as long as everything uh, was in good condition, the ground was in good condition, yeah, to answer your question, we could do it tomorrow. I wouldn't feel comfortable quite yet getting you entirely out of the cab. I think that it'll be a ways before we have uh, full self-driving tractors that you'd feel comfortable with going to sleep at night and, and waking up and knowing that the, the job was done, but it, it'll be there very, 
soon. It's got to be a big hurdle that you mentioned as far as like the ground conditions. And we've all been working ground or whatever. And then you it's it's getting dark and all of a sudden it starts bunching up or whatever. It's got to be yeah. able to sense all that stuff, doesn't it? Yep, it does. And that's where we're at. Those are the things we want. Difficult when you have good conditions all the time. You want to have a mix of about 50 50. You want good conditions and bad conditions because we're training a the system to know and see those those differences and, and to react and to see the engine power and things like that. And, you know, with our perception and the, the sensors that we're working with, we can really get to a really finite detail. It's just everything is so different. And so right now, like I said, we're running it as a service. And so we're trying to get into all those different areas to see those different conditions. Yeah, I shoot. You know, every time you try to go all night, it seems like something happens. And I remember going about, I don't know, 10 rounds one time with a, it was the packing wheel and the planter. It was, it was yep. caught up and just digging a oh, okay. big ass rut. Corn wasn't in, going in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I found it out. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I just am dreading seeing how bad this yeah. looks in the morning. How, yeah. Yeah, because you're half awake. But yeah, I know yep, know the feeling. And so that's the kind of thing that we're trying to work towards to, to eliminate so that we can see and sense that. And we're not trying to remove the farm. If you, you know, if you wanted to be in that cab, you could be in that cab. But at the same time, we want to make a system that's smart enough to, uh, to give you that comfort that you don't have to be. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So you're out there in Silicon Valley now or New Mexico, wherever the hell you're at. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What's next for Daniel Carmichael? That's a great question. You know, I have these fabulous weekends now that I have total control of. You know, I work hard during the week, but I'm able to get out. I would say, you know, as I get into my 30s, I'm ready to surrender some of that freedom and decision making now, settle down. And uh, I certainly, you know, I'm putting my heart and soul into, into the startup and to make sure that, you know, we make a product and we help farmers and producers. And that's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. But those two things, it's certainly going to be uh, settling down and focusing on startup right now. That's what's next for me. Will it ever be back at Maplehurst? You know, I would like to think so someday. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see myself calling California home. Certainly the day will come. It probably won't be anytime soon. You know, it's going to take a lot out here with the company. But, uh, but yeah, I would like to, like to see the day when I come back. Yeah, for sure. All right, I'm going to end with this question, okay? You're out there in Silicon Valley. Even though it's an ag company, it's not, right? So you've gotten outside of agriculture. Grew up on the farm. I've been farming on my own for 20 years, well, 19. I've had three good years. I mean, three years where I look at it, I'm like, these are the margins that I really should be making. Comfortable yeah. living, all this stuff. At some point, you know, I think every farmer looks at it and goes, you know, I don't know if it's worth all of this struggle. I don't know if all this risk is worth the thin margins that we're dealing with. You've stepped outside of ag now. What's your view on that? Farming is something you have to have a passion for, for starters. But at the same time, you have to come at it with, with a business mind. What I see, the people that are, are truly successful in farming, you know, and, and I'm fortunate to, to see a lot of different farmers and producers the people to me that really haven't figured out are the ones that know things that they know and they know the things they don't know. They know the things that they're passionate about and they know the things that they're not passionate about, whether that be marketing or merchandising. And, and so they turn that over to Maplehurst or somebody that knows that side of the business. You know, they don't try and do it all themselves. To answer your question, I think that to be profitable and, and to to really make it in farming, I think that's those are the things you have to know about your operation, about yourself. You have to know, you know, the things that you want to do and the things you're passionate about and the things that you're good at and the things that you're not, and then to outsource those things to the right people. Okay. I, I still don't does know. So, it does, does, but that, it's, I tell you what, it's like the down economy in agriculture right now. It gets more people thinking about it. And, you know, when you go off, you got the the job that has the benefits and has the retirement plan and all that. You're right. Number one, you do have to have a passion for it. I don't care what you say. You look at it as a business. It is a little different. You have to have a passion to want to get up and do this. And that might be true with every yeah. self-owned business. But if you don't have that, yeah, I, I think you might as well just pack it up. But 
Uh, unfortunately, I'm addicted yeah. to it. And as you know, there's tough years and there's good years. It's something that's not going away. Boy, that's a tough question. That's a good question, Rob. <laughs> that's a really good no, you're not dealing with a chimp it's, here, it's, buddy. It's, it's, <laughs> right, right. No, no. You're. <laughs> but it's different things to different people, you know, too. I mean, you've got the, the people that, that make it work as a small business. I think of like the Whiskey Acres and mm-hmm. you know, what the people in DeKalb are doing. I mean, like, okay, there's a good run farming operation, but they're also doing a, this value-added proposition to their business. And I think farmers and people that can do that, you know, add a, an incredible amount of value to their business. And then you have the guys that get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that works sometimes too, as long as you're growing sustainably, you're not just throwing out a bunch of money for cash rent too. And, and there's a lot of different answers to that question. I think. Yeah, yeah. I know it's not a fair question, but I don't apologize. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Of course not. Well, who, who is our advertiser today, Rob? We didn't go through our ad. It's not Morton Buildings. I love the awkwardness that you add to every podcast with the, with the, <laughs> the you know, who you throw into the advertiser. I love that part. Well, I also, I, I think that the, the loudest I've laughed at your podcast has to be the young man from Iowa. I think he was the youngest guy you've had on your, on your show. Oh, yeah. And, Cameron. Uh, Cameron, yes, young Cameron. When you, I think I said it a couple of different times when you said something about happy wife, happy life, and he said in this young monotone voice, you know, ain't that the truth? I'm just like <laughs> this guy has you know, no idea, but at the same time, funniest thing ever. Uh, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Oh well. All right. Well, Daniel Carmichael, I know how busy you are, and I appreciate you taking the time. I know there's a lot of people interested in, you know, around upper Illinois and what you're up to and that and the story. And your your family's business is uh, kind of a marquee business. It's very well run. It's kind of a staple up there. It's a standard. I think it's fascinating how you want to go ahead and carve out your own chapter in life out there in Silicon Valley. It's a cool situation. And I want to thank you for sharing it with all of us. Thank you for having me, Rob. I really appreciate it. Well, Daniel Carmichael, thank you very much. And everyone else, we hope you tune in next week. And thank you for listening to the Shark Farmer Podcast. I am your host, Rob Sharkey. Please visit us at www.sharkeyfarms.com. And just search for Shark Farmer to follow me on Twitter. Later. Later.